Hey, what's up, guys? We're going to be talking in our immersion session today about the difference between uh, analog and digital, just taking a look at some actual sound files that have used a combination of those techniques and how they work together to overall give you the sonic capabilities you really want to be able to bring to your streaming services or to radio and stuff like that. So just kind of give you an idea that we're going to start off with a session that has some major components that were recorded in a large format studio. Uh, I'm going to bring up some images so you can kind of see and get an idea of where this was recorded and even how it was brought together. So let's take a quick look. All right, so uh, we're going to take a look here real quickly. A um, couple things about this session. So this particular session was captured at the studio at the Palms. And um, just to give you an idea, a sense of what that, that looks like and, and how that particular operation worked. Uh, this is the artist Daniel Park. I uh, was contracted to do an album with uh, in collaboration with Zappos.com to bring about a Christmas album a few years ago for their, essentially for their team. They really wanted to build something that was just like fun for their team to, to listen to around the holidays instead of the traditional uh, standards and Christmas music that's out. So we actually got to uh, work together to produce and write some original uh, works in the studio. And uh, just to give you an idea, this is, uh, this is the studio at the Palms. Let's bring this up so you can see it. So the studio at the Palms is a large format analog suite that's connected to Pro Tools via uh, a Mac. So there's a it's a combination of the analog and digital. And so it boasts an 88 channel console uh, along with racks and racks of analog gear. Uh, and it really brings the tone as like you really get, you'll get a sense of like what, what makes it different is that the sounds that you're able to capture in that kind of a space, that kind of a room uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, it definitely takes a lot of time and energy to get there, uh, but but completely worth it. This is a shot of the live room. You can see we have the drummer set up, and this particular angle was just kind of show how we got the drums captured. So you can see me back there on the console uh, with the artist Daniel Park, and this is uh, my buddy Danny playing drums, and we have a multi mic situation going on with the drums uh, as well as two different sets of overhead mics so that we could use them in different scenarios because we were cutting about 12 songs on this particular weekend. Uh, we have a stereo combs um, ribbon mics uh, as our rooms, and you can see how distant they are, and then we have about a $10,000 uh, tube mic uh, right from uh, uh, Telefunken right here in the middle of the shot. And so uh, you can kind of get that sense of space and kind of what we were setting up. And as we look at that, the reason we bring this up is because this stuff was all shot through analog gear. And there's me sitting next to one of the analog racks we have set up just for the drums. And, uh, and if we kind of scoot through those, you can see um, this is all analog gear. And the analog stage, again, is all uh, voltage. It's all uh, electrical and it utilizes... Uh, and both transistors and resistors to be able to give you that tone and that sound. And so uh, you see a pair of preamps used for the overheads. Um, there's a compressor here for another set of overheads. And this is the preamp rack for the majority of the, the, the good stuff that's going on. This is a Neve uh, preamp plus EQ rack. So each one of these is, is upwards of about $7,000 a piece. So each one of these particular channels. And it all comes down to British made electronics, vintage era. Uh, just really, really fantastic stuff. You can see we have all our mics run through here. And they end up routing to the console. So like, as oh, sorry, as we kind of slide through there and take a look. Um, you know, we have an 1176 running those snare, uh, the snares, um, top and bottom, and then an overall room, uh, LA 2A, uh, rocking that room sound. And as I mentioned in my class today, uh, the LA 2A, this is a vintage piece of gear. You can get it for about seven grand. Um, if you buy it now, if you buy the vintage versions, they could be anywhere between 10 and 15 
thousand dollars and uh the issue with the vintage version which this was a very nice authentic vintage uh teletronics la2a i don't know how old it is it's definitely over 20 years old um, this is an all tube compressor device and the biggest issue that we ran into is that between these two devices the uh, you can see there's different volumes and they were both outputting at different volumes and so they had a really hard time uh maintaining consistency between the two of them so so it really just meant that like you know you had to watch your meters you had to really that's and that's something that's tough about vintage when you're working with the vintage analog stuff you got to really keep an eye on what's going on uh we're running some bass and another piece of bass in these dbx 110s and the la3a which is a solid state version of that and then there's this um mono room going on on this compressor this uh tube tech compressor and then some of my favorites, I, I have a DBX, uh, this is a DBX uh, 160A, I have a DBX 160A, I love that one, um, fantastic device, uh, and then there's an SSL compressor, we didn't use this, this is actually a surround sound compressor, so we didn't use that one, but we use this master bus on the overhead, and then we have uh, in distressor land, which is all these distressors are modern, these are modern analog devices um, created in the 90s, you know, we got things like toms, the kick punch, and all that kind of stuff, so really really exciting session to work on and that's really how we got to some of the sounds that you hear with the drum so that crispiness you get in a drum sound um there's a lot going on but but if we really just kind of focus in on on what's happening with the drums we can find them real quick in that drum group and just take a look oh slight modification hold on the globals are off oh Probably one of the best parts about uh, what's being done with these tracks as we look at these, we have um, the we have a printed kick, a, a printed snare. What that means is these are actually printed with compression and analog devices already on them. You know, so a lot of these were recorded with analog devices, but then were then they were further processed and printed with those analog devices on them. So, so a lot of these are actually running through um, an additional, oops, an additional uh, DBX vintage DBX compressor to really give them that sound, and that's how they really. So, they, even though they're stored in the digital realm, they were very much processed and recorded in analog, and that's how you really kind of get that sound, that crisp the brightness in the tones. Um, it really had, you know, we, it kind of felt a little more like, this was kind of more like a Weezer-esque kind of feel. So when you get to the guitar, you see the exact same thing. So in the electric guitars, this is another guitar print. You can kind of, you can see that vibe as it starts to flare out a little bit. But it's got that, that warmth, and it's got even that little punch to it from the analog run. Now the vocals additionally were sung through um, that ten thousand dollar tube mic, and they were also print. They were processed and printed. So by the time we get to vocal land, we have a real strong 
defined vocal, but the vocals were also run through uh, the LA-2A. So going back to that LA-2A uh, image, let's see if we can find a shot of this so you can under, kind of get a sense of it. Um, oh, I saw one, but that one's through the glass. Oh, there we go. So here's our vocal setup right here. You can see there's our vocal going through our LA-2A. It's also hitting that large format console. So it's so it's still actually get, being routed to the, the console uh, via the patch bay and our patch bay actually I'll show you the rest of these from here I think so our patch bay looks like this and it's feeding all those lines in and out of our devices through the rooms and so we have a small room this is the tight room we used uh, tight ISO we used for the acoustic guitar and we actually did a combination of oops we did a combination of localized mics with room ribbon mics in order to get that kind of sound uh, and then you could see uh, little closer versions of those setups. And then this is, these are the pass-throughs that come through through, the, through those rooms. And so they're patched in, routed to those rooms. Uh, and this is the small group choir that we were using uh, to get some of the sounds that we got. Again, there's Danny working it in there. These are our uh, studio assistants. That was actually Studio B um, at the Palms. Uh, but there's that large format console again, and this is that, this is that kind of stuff that really gets gets very very technical, uh, but definitely been fantastic to get into. Uh, I did not find one. Let me see if I can find a vocal mic picture. Oh, there we go. We can see there's Daniel. Uh, we were actually doing a mic test. We were doing a mic shootout, making sure we have the right mic for him. We wanted to make sure we had. I mean, this was the most expensive mic in the studio, but it didn't necessarily mean it was the right fit for the vocalist. In this instance, though, it, it was. And uh, it's a tube mic, so it has to stay inverted, otherwise it would overheat the elements. So the heat, the tube is here, the heat goes this way. It's attached to its mic stand. Uh, again, a really expensive Telefunken, and uh, a really fantastic sound. And this uh, LA-2A compressor really allows it to cut. So let's take a look. Let's take a listen to the printed version of this. Now when we get to the end of this, sorry, when we get to the end of this, uh, we actually have that group vocal sing at the end of the song, and uh, the benefit of using the large format console is that by using a large format console, we can do a lot of these prints by groups. So we actually printed these groups down in, we printed some harmony groups, and then we, print, we printed this group vocal sing, and if we listen to it isolated, again, this is being processed through some analog gear and going into the digital land. Yeah, so pretty, you know, uh, overall, we get some really great tones out of using this uh, analog process. You know, in the questions, in the line of questions that we, we see from this particular week, 
Um, all of really all of the tracks in here are actually being processed through analog, and then they're being brought in through digital. And the benefit that we get in working with digital is we can go in and cut them up. We can definitely uh, move them around, slide them for time. And then at the end of the day, when we're done, we just save it, close it, move on to the next song. And so digital recording in the digital realm really provides the speed that we need, um, while recording in the, with the analog realm really gives us a lot of the tone that we need. Now, technically, uh, in the same way, if we go back to that, that vocal uh, print, we do have plugins that can do this. We do have plugins that can do this, and they can do it fairly well. It uh, it doesn't mean they necessarily. Oops, sorry, it doesn't mean they necessarily are hitting all of the right cues for this, but they're very close. So, um, like if you go to waves.com uh, right now, of course they're having all their wonderful sales. But if you go to waves.com, you can find the CLA two A, which I think is a fantastic version of the two A. Uh, this the LA two A. In, in the CLA version is way more um, uh, punchy. This is a uh, Chris Lordow's version of the CL of the LA two A, and it really just essentially is the punch. Uh, this room really gives you. It, this is a very smooth compressor, so the the idea there was let's basically just add punch. But if you happen to be fortunate enough to work with uh, any of the Apollo equipment um, from Universal Audio, you'll also ha uh, probably be somewhat familiar with. One of the best, probably the best LA-2A plugin that exists, which is this Universal Audio Teletronics version. And it's ideally, it's like the same thing. You know, you get a lot of those same sounds. Uh, there's a lot that you can get from it. And, and of course, that's how we really get to that sound. And uh, so we can really emulate that. Additionally, on this vocal already is uh, a tape emulator. So... So like the goal here is to give it some some saturation and that tape saturation feel comes from here. So, you know, the vocals, the drums, guitars, those guys are all being recorded in this analog space, uh, but they're technically also being dumped into digital, into the digital realm. Uh, this session was captured at high res. Uh, I don't remember which one, either 88.2 or 96K. Oh, these are 88.2 sessions, so... You know, again, in that conversation about HD audio versus SD audio, you're actually hearing it um, converted as you watch it through YouTube, but I recorded it back to this video at 88.2. So, like, essentially, the the it starts high res. You might not necessarily be able to feel all that from home, but, but this essentially, when you release music at 88.2 or even just above, you know, 48 in any realm... Um, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, all of those can take the high-res versions and they can deliver them to the listener just as they are. So the beauty, the beauty of that is we work in high-res, we operate in high-res, and it actually now is able to be released in high-res. So uh, hopefully that kind of walks you through a little bit of those concepts uh, if you weren't familiar, if you hadn't really seen them much. But it's all really about the sound. We're just chasing that sound. We're trying to make that sound pristine and, and go big every time. Awesome. Talk to you guys soon.